Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to yet another broadcast from the Hindu Academy team. My name is Nishit Kotak. I'm here with my colleagues, Manish Pai, Sita, and Vijay Bhai. And uh, if you're watching us on Facebook or on YouTube, then you would know that this is a session that we have every weekend. It's on Saturdays at 2 o'clock UK time, and it runs for about an hour. And what we do is we discuss uh, questions around Hinduism. The format of this call is generally we start with a little video that we'll have a discussion around that video and then we will launch into a Q&A session and you the viewers who are watching us live can post your questions in the comments area on YouTube, Facebook or even on Twitter and we will attempt to answer your questions live on air. So uh, without further ado, let me just move over to today's video which we will be starting with. As you know, this week we celebrated Ramakrishna's birthday on the 18th of February. He is a central figure for modern Hinduism and its reform. And uh, I want to show this little video which discusses how Ramakrishna unified Hinduism or, and Sanatana Dharma. So let's get into this and then we will come back uh, to discuss the video again. This marvelous religion that you come from is, can best be described as a family of sectarian movements. Vastly different variety of different expressions of spirituality come under the umbrella of Hinduism. This is the breath of vision of this religion. It allows variety of different ways of exploring the idea of spirituality in different ages. It's a very broad enterprise. So this is why it appears, sometimes appears scattered and at loggerheads. So it is crucial that some kind of reconciliation must be sought. In fact, let me tell you the story. 150 years ago in India, we find Hinduism in real, in tatters. The different strands of Hinduism were not reconciled, they were lay completely disjointed and kind of floating in air. You got the Vaishnavites focusing on Vishnu, you got the Shaivites focusing on Shiva, you got the Shaktos focusing on the Mother Goddess, you got the Arya Sama saying God without form. And then you got the variety of different philosophic approaches saying your essential nature is the spirit, you are God. So all these vastly different, if you like, you know, various movements were visible in India and this produced a highly scattered enterprise not reconciled at all, intellectually or in any other sense. In fact, Ninian Smart, one of the ma marvelous personalities, uh, one of the you know, modern theologians who, who I respect, said something very interesting. He said, 150 years ago, ago, Hinduism was in tatters. If you've got any system of thought where the different parts of the particular system do not sit well with each other, you produce a very jagged, a very disjointed system which is not at ease with itself. So here begins my story. You see, in a way, it's good that you'd ask me to come and talk about, if you like, reconciliation of different strands of Hinduism, because I've been inspired by Swami Vivekananda, and his mentor, most people have not even heard the name, is Sri Ramakrishna. Now, Sri Ramakrishna is a very unique personality, because in this one life, we find reconciliation of various aspects of Hinduism, Shaivism, Vaishnavism, Shakti, Shakto, shak, shakto ideas of ideas of uh, my essential nature spirit all reconciled not intellectually with drinks and drinking cups of coffee but it will experientially this is incredible in fact one of this very interesting very astute thinker and an atheist sir arnold toynbee says something very interesting he said in the life of sri ramakrishna we find the variety of spiritual experiences the comprehensive nature of his spiritual experiences has not been seen in the face of on the face of this earth in the East or West. This is a very dramatic statement to pass. Highly comprehensive, because what happened is this. This one man, in this one man we find, if you like, the aspiration of millions of Hindus over thousands of years coming to fruition in one life, in one human being. Incredible. And yet many of you may not even have heard his name. In fact, I would not have heard his name unless I came across Swami Vivekananda. The fireball is through through the West. And it is through Vivekananda that I came across this marvelous personality, Sri Ramakrishna. And the reason why I'm saying starting my journey by bringing him into the picture is this. Here we find reconciliation at a, gen a genuine level, not only purely intellectually, mm, let's see, think philosophically, but at experiential level. 
this man in this one lifetime was able to experience, no, take the bhakti movement and experience the idea of God as Vishnu to his conclusion. He could take on the idea of, uh, you know, thinking of God like the mother goddess and come to his conclusion, actually experience mother goddess. In the next moment, he goes into deepest meditation and says, I am the spirit, I am Atman. In one lifetime, switching from one to the other. So various, if you like, strands of Hinduism which were never reconciled, were reconciled in this one life. This is the story. So you have chosen a good speaker because I come from a tradition <laughs> that has already reconciled the various strands of Hinduism. Brilliant. So that is a great way to start today's topic. And what I'd like to do is now hand over to Manish Pai, who is going to carry on with the starting of today's uh, discussion around this video. And uh, we will then carry on with the live Q&A shortly after that. Manish Pai, over to you. Thank you, Nishad Bhai. Uh, namaste, viewers. Uh, hope you had a good week uh, and welcome to the um, our YouTube Q&A session. So last week we saw how you know Swami Vivekananda guaranteed that meditation, if done sincerely um, and rigorously, with uh, you know sincere efforts, will lead one to spiritual experience. And this video uh, now we see Sri Ramakrishna experiencing the ultimate reality in different uh, ways, and it's kind of uh, reconciling all the different uh, pathways that. Uh, a Bhagavad Gita or Hinduism offers. Um, so, Vijay Bhai, yes, we don't see anyone else having this level of experience where uh, they can experientially say all paths leading to same goal. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very, very uh, unique and individual, very special personality because the thing is this, you know, I mean, there's two things here, right? Not only did he do an intra kind of faith reconciliation, but also interfaith reconciliation. That's really special about Ramakrishna Paramahansa. The thing is, is that, uh, I mean, if you look at the ages, you will not find a personality because, I mean, as you know, it's during the time of Ramakrishna Paramahansa that we see all these different facets of religion in India. Not only facets of different religions, but also different strands of, of belief within the same kind of tradition as well. And for Ramakrishna Paramahansa, unify them all and show that actually they all lead to one path, actually kind of vindicates the message of the Vedas and also in the Gita where Krishna says, you know, whoever comes to me in whatsoever way, I accept thee. And it's really special. And the thing is this, yes, we live in a world where there's so many exclusive beliefs, exclusive, exclusive beliefs, where they say, only my path is right. If you believe another path, you are, you are damned for you know, eternity. I mean, come on. How, how can you even say that, right? If God is the all unanimous brand, some entity which is everywhere, all encompassing to the universe, how can you say that there's only one little doorway you go through? Any of the doorways will give you a lot of trouble. And people, you know, say all these kind of things, but then we have this one supreme, amazing giant, you know, personality who said, look, actually, you know, it doesn't make even rational sense to say mine is the only part. Not only that, he actually experienced them. And that's the key word. He experienced that actually all paths have to be the same divine. It cannot be any other way. I mean, we know, we think about this, yes, but for somebody to experience it firsthand and to prove it firsthand, and that, that is just mind-blowing. That that's, that's, that's really amazing stuff. And that's what really kind of pulls you to a Ramakrishna Paramahans, yes? I mean, if you get a chance to read his, uh, his gospel, it's, it's, it's very, very... I, all I can say, it takes you to another level, yes. Uh, Sita Ben... <laughs> Yeah, and I think you basically covered it. I mean, the thing with Ramakrishna is that um, he got rid of the idea that pluralism means relativism. It does, pluralism does not mean anything and everything goes, just stick everything in the basket, everything is fine. <laughs> um, Ramakrishna actually 
proved like the, all of these pathways that Hindus have been using for thousands of years are true, they are correct. And, you know, not just Pakti Yoga, but all of these different other pathways and also different approaches, all the different pavas that you get, Shantapal, Dasyapal, all of that, he tried them all and showed that they were actual, actual pathways for making spiritual progress. And then like Vijay Bhai said, he extended it to other religions, forget just Hinduism, other religions as well. So it's like he foresaw that the world is coming together. People of different religions are going to be living together, spending time with each other. And instead of sort of promoting an exclusivist agenda, he said, look, these are all pathways which are true and make that you can achieve enlightenment through these different pathways. So he's actually foreseen that there was a need for this religious harmony in such a global world. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming more and more global, becoming so interlinked with all these different religions, people of no religion as well. So he came just before, you know, the time that we actually need it. Mm -hmm. And we need to kind of make sure that as many people as possible are aware of these, um, his amazing experiences, because it gives validity to so many different pathways for making spiritual progress. Wonderful answers there from Sita Ben and uh, Vijay Bhai. So we see um, Swami Vivekananda describing him as Avatar Varistaya, the most superior Avatar. What do you have to say about that, uh, Sita Ben? Um, I obviously am biased because I've grown <laughs> up with the Ramakrishna tradition, but I personally do think that's true because, yes, we've had lots of prophets and saints in the past, but they, they do make spiritual progress and achieve it, but only through one particular pathway. Nowhere throughout history have we come across somebody who has experienced God in such a huge variety of different ways that nobody comes near it. So in my mind, for sure, he's definitely the best <laughs> avatar. And um, he is relatable to so many people, not just the bhakti tradition or not just... Um, you know, certain types of Hindus, certain sects of Hindus. He is, um, you know, appealing to everybody, not even Hindus, forget just Hindus, Christians, Muslims as well, because he's actually practiced those religions and proved their validity. So he is really the most appealing avatar um, in modern times. And we're so lucky that he lived so recently and we can read about his life and his teachings in such detail. Um, especially the gospel, like Vijay Pai was saying, it's really mind blowing when you read it. So I definitely recommend it. Um, Vijay Pai? Yeah, I, I think the thing is a very big question. I'll give you one, my own experiences. I, I'm actually from the innovation of tradition, from the Swaminar faith. And I came across Ramakrishna Paramahansa teaching, actually surprising, someone's given by monks of the Swaminar faith and talking about how experiences come to you of the divine if you have a, a very you know, divine nature. Your personality is good. You've got an amazing nature, and the nature of love and you know compassion. The divinity comes to you. That's the first time I actually heard of it. You surprised from my own tradition. That's when I went to explore. So in that case, you can see that he's a very loving personality. Some other interesting thing as well to remember is that even people who are very agnostic or atheists or who are kind of, if you know, they're kind of pulled to him, like Keshav Chandra Sen. I mean, he was from the Brahma Samaj. Even he somehow felt pulled and he had the need to go and see him despite him having kind of a very exclusivist, you know, almost like a little bit like monotheist belief. He still felt a need to be attracted to him. Same with Vivekananda. So there must be something really unique about him to attract people of this kind of broad genre. So it's, it's really, really special in that sense. So yeah, amazing stuff. Yeah. Wonderful uh, answer there again. Um, so we, we, meant, we had mention of uh, Gospel of Ram Krishna a couple of times already. So if you could look in, uh, what is uh, this book all about, uh, um, Sita Uh So it's written by M, um, he, he calls himself M. Uh, he's uh, one of the lay disciples of uh, Sri Ramakrishna. And he's got a very naturally poetic style of writing. So you kind of get elevated to this really spiritual sort of atmosphere as soon as you start reading it. He describes the you know, the way everything is, the sun is setting or whatever. And it really sets the mood for then 
you feel like you're kind of following Emma around um, and you see him sort of sitting next to Sri Ramakrishna, listening to the dialogues that he has, listening to the questions that people put to him and the amazingly simple way in which he can express such deep spiritual ideas through simple examples, uh, simple stories um, in such a way that, you know, like I couldn't put it down. <laughs> um, it's a very big book, but if you love Sri Ramakrishna, it's, um, you can't put it down basically. And I think even if you never heard of Sri Ramakrishna and you start reading the gospel, you'll just be completely in love with Sri Ramakrishna by the end of it. Uh, Vijay Play. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I should it when I kind of want to feel calm or feel happy. If I'm really moody, sad or something, I pick his book and read it. Read it. And immediately, because the thing is, when you have some great personality, and we talk about some great personality, his love, compassion, his love for humanity, his love for divinity, it just, as it said, takes you to another level. And it's, it's such, such I, I can't explain it. You could just pick it up yourself and read it, really. Yeah. That's all I can say, yeah. Wonderful answer there. So a bit about my personal reading of uh, Sri Ramakrishna uh, as uh, gospel Kathamrit. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I have some trouble or something confusing me, I read that book and somehow find answers to my questions. So it, it's really amazing. And if you want to know how a God realized person, a person with spiritual experience, how he lived, how he talked, how he behaved, that is the book to refer to mm -hmm. because uh, I am actually met uh, Ram Krishna so many times and he wrote in his diary uh, all his ex uh, ex experiences and his uh, discussion with Ram Krishna and how other people were talking about it. And from his diary, he uh, wrote this book and it's wonderful to have that level of detail for, for, for a person who has had that spiritual experience. So, Anyone who hasn't read it, highly recommend it. Uh, we take first question from uh, a viewer, Adityanathan K. He's saying, do we have to believe in God, Vijay Bhai? Do we have to believe in God? Okay, depends what you mean by God, because uh, no, you'd be surprised. I know a lot of Hindus may not like me for saying this, but technically no, because it depends, you know, what branch of Hinduism you come from, because there are a lot of people who believe in God as a principle, and there's a reason why. I mean, people people ask me, why can't you believe in, why folks should probably believe in a God as a person? Look, in Hinduism, you know, we believe all life has, you know, uh, the divine Atman, right? So the question is, why would God be uh, human-centered? Why not universe-centered? Or why not transcend the idea of form you know, and become a principle? Because whenever, we, mostly what we are really doing is getting the, the ultimate principle and bringing him down in a human form so you can relate to him easily. But having said that, the idea of the divine, the spirit, it's the many ways to push it. I mean, as Sita mentions so often that in the case of atheists or who are not, they may find the idea of spirituality in other endeavors like sports, you know, nature. So there are many, many ways to progress spiritually. So you don't have to believe in a God, specifically in a particular way by a particular sectarian movement or a particular person. No, there's a wide variety of ways. Yeah, Sita. Um, yeah, so I think um, believing in God is maybe the starting point of your spiritual journey. And sometimes, like Vijay Bhai said, you don't even have to believe in God. Um, you can use any sort of particular pathway that is suited to your temperament uh, in order to be able to find um, or get that spiritual experience. Um, so I guess belief is the starting point. But the other important thing to remember is that you can only ever really believe believe once you've kind of touched base with that spiritual experience you can never actually know until you kind of touch that um so in a way part of you i guess is almost always agnostic to start with when you are starting your spiritual journey you're just agnostic you don't actually know you only know when you've actually had that experience so you can only um you know make sure that you, you've had that experience before you know Wonderful answer there, Sita Ben and Vijay Bhai. Um, so uh, there's a question from Vishan Tomer. Which gospel are you talking about? I would like to read it. Is it the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna by Swami Nikhilananda? Yes, that is. Uh, so if you want to read the English version of it, uh, that is the gospel to follow. And if you Google uh, Ramakrishna Vivekanand info, you can find online copy of it. So 
uh, there you go. You can read it for free as well. And uh, if you want to purchase it, uh, you can buy it from any of the Ramakrishna missions uh, centers. So that as well. It's also available in many languages in India and I think throughout the world. So most languages you will find it. So uh, there's no, yeah, you can go ahead and uh, read that. Uh, next question we take from Raj Kumar. He's saying, uh, if a non-Hindu asks you how to prove that your way of life or religion is correct, what will be your answer? Vijay Bhai? Okay, so, the, the, well, Hinduism, you know, doesn't think like the other, because what is, this is a typical question that uh, people from, say, XTC faith will challenge you on that. They'll say, oh, prove your path is right, yeah? I can prove mine is right. Technically speaking, you cannot prove something objectively, something that is spiritual in nature. You can't use an objective means to prove it. So to ask someone to prove that religion is correct in that sense, it, it doesn't really help because it's not a, it's not a material stuff, right? It's, so what you can show about Hinduism says that actually there are many ways to, to work spiritually. If you feel that it helps you progress spiritually and makes you a better, better person in the spiritual sense, then actually your path is, is valid for you. And something reminds me of what even Vivekananda once said. Somebody asked him, so how many religions are there in India? And he basically said, there are as many religions as there are people, basically, yes? So I think in that sense, it's, it's, you can't prove it objectively because no matter how hard you try, you can use books, you can use my guru, whatever, yes? Uh, you can use all kinds of methods. But if you ask to prove objectively that it not work like that, yeah? it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual endeavor. So I think it's difficult to answer that question in that sense. It depends on how you feel about it. See that, man? Um, yeah, I think uh, the sort of main way that we can, in a way, prove it, if we haven't experienced it ourselves that just yet, is um, just point to the prophets and saints who we have, um, you know, so many of them. We're so lucky that we've got so many prophets and saints and not just restricted to ancient times, to modern times as well. There's obviously Ramakrishna, there's Raman Maharshi. All of these people have had... Um, amazing spiritual experiences and it's written about in our modern language in English so it's easily accessible and when you read through these books or their teachings you feel so uplifted and inspired it makes you think there must be something special there's nothing ordinary here there's something extraordinary behind these words so that's I guess um, the closest that we can get to proving um, you know, the validity of our religion until we actually get there ourselves. Wonderful answer there, uh, Sita Ben. Uh, we got an interesting question from Tana Lechmi Gangadharan. She's saying, you know, uh, goddess Kali is uh, normally depicted as very fierce and holding weapons and uh, it's a frightening image. Uh, so he, she's asking, what is your opinion of Ram Krishna Paramhansa or singing of God, Goddess Kali? Sita Bin? Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, like you were saying, the image of Kali is uh, quite terrifying. And um, it's something that some people sort of want to shy away from. They're like, ah, God should be nice and beautiful and happy. And what's all this? <laughs> but the, we have to also realize that Hinduism is so broad that it recognizes that we have to acknowledge the, the other side to just creation and preservation. Um, there's also the other side that, you know, the time, in a way, because the word Kali itself comes from the Sanskrit word Kal, which means time. And we realize that time is the all destroyer. So as time goes on, things get destroyed, but then it opens the pathway for regeneration, for new growth. And that's the cycle of creation. That's the cycle of the universe. And Hinduism acknowledges that through this fierce form of the mother goddess, uh, which is terrifying because any kind of destruction is terrifying for us. It frightens us. But Hinduism says, no, we should face it. This is part of creation. This is the nature of the universe. So we should acknowledge, um, you know, this idea of destruction as well, being part of creation. And um, another thing is that Sri Ramakrishna was drawn to this particular image. Perhaps he chose the, this image of the mother goddess to say, look, this is nothing to fear. She is the mother goddess. She is there to protect you, look after you. And she is, you know, she was his best friend. She was with him like all the time. It's amazing the level of 
closeness he had with the mother goddess Kali. Um, so in a way, he's kind of dispelling the fear around the image of um, Kali. And I think another important thing to think about is that throughout the ages, people or prophets and saints have experienced God in a male form, like they've seen God as Ram, God as Krishna. But here, Ram Krishna is actually experiencing God as a female. And like I've said before, this is the age of women now. <laughs> so it's really important that the idea of the mother goddess is brought to life in this way, because before it was just seen in images and, you know, not real. Whereas Ramakrishna was able to bring this idea of the mother goddess to life. Uh, Vijay Bhai? Yeah, I think Sita, you explained very nicely. One thing I would say that I've noticed when I look at Mother Kali's, it actually also reminds me that, you know, ultimately, Time is all destroyer. So getting attached to all this material stuff will never get you near Makali. If you want to get near to her, you have to let go because, see, you forget quite often that I mean, even if you look at uh, in science, the so called second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, ultimately everything has to go. And we quite often forget that. And Makali is very good to me, represent of this. The kind of thermodynamics, it links very well. So ultimately, everything will go. So, I mean, she's a mother. If you go no, go near her and you forget all that stuff which you don't need in your life to kind of bind you to the material stuff. So in a very unique kind of uh, form of mother goddess. But I, I, in a way, I'm very pleased that Hinduism has such a form because it tends to remind you that Carl, time doesn't wait for anybody. So if you're going to get stuck in time and do all these material things, then you will not succeed. So it's a very good reminder in that sense. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it, I think it's, it's lovely in my view. It's, it's a good form of uh, mother goddess. One thing to keep in mind is that um, quite often in the olden days, there should be something called a thuggy cult who used to kind of worship Maka in a negative way. And it is true that they used to sacrifice young boys, not girls, but boys. But they have been destroyed now during the British time. Thank God to the British for that. So I think it depends how. So you want to worship Makali like how Ramakrishna Paramahansa is. That's all I can say. And, and get the best love from Makali. Yeah. That's Wonderful it. answer, uh, Sita Ben and Vijay Bhai. So staying with, um, uh, you know, a mother goddess Kali and uh, sacrifices as well. We see not just Ramakrishna Paramahansa, Swami Vivekananda also, you know, talking about Kali. He wrote a poem on mother goddess Kali as well, which is a quite potent one if one finds to read it. So what's your uh, take on that uh, idea of sacrifice and Swami Vivekananda's take on uh, Mother Goddess Kali? Vijay So I think the thing is regarding the sacrifice, it, it depends, yeah? I mean, there are all kinds of sacrifices. As a general rule, sacrifice is something you do to achieve something higher, to give something smaller, to achieve something higher. And that should be your focus, yes? So I know there have been temples where there have been a lot of animal sacrifice as well. For as as, as cruel as it sounds for, so for some people, for some remote tribes, I wouldn't, I'm not in no position to judge them. But they have done this because they had believed that that makes them progress spiritually. But on the whole, I think that is kind of given up in this day and age because men have now moved on and enlightened. But at that time, it was done practiced by some people. So but I think in this modern age, sacrifice purely sacrifice your own inner desires, own inner kind of attachment, or sacrifice anything lower to achieve something higher. And that's the kind of goal, which also Vivekananda describes, that that's the key sacrifice, how to progress yourself by giving something little to achieve something bigger. And that should be our kind of goal. Uh, Sita Ben? Um, yeah, I think uh, it's, sacrifice is not just restricted to the Hindu tradition. It's um, throughout humanity, throughout the ages, and in sort of more ancient times, it was more sort of brutal in a way. So they would uh, sacrifice animals, they would sacrifice all sorts of things. And you're like, ah, what, <laughs> what is this? But as time has moved on, I think people are sort of evolving and not doing such sort of gruesome or brutal sacrifices, but more sort of like Vijay Bhai was saying, more focusing on sacrificing our sort of desires and sacrificing, you know, things that we like in order to then achieve something higher. So it's not just within Hinduism, for example, even in Christianity, you've got the idea of Lent as well. That's where you mm -hmm. give up something that you enjoy in order that you can then focus on more spiritual aspirations. And same in Hinduism, um, you know, during festival times, we have periods where people fast, they choose not to eat certain foods 
in order that they can then focus their minds on more spiritual matters um, rather than getting caught up in our everyday life and living like animals and just eating and drinking whatever we like. We say, no, look, we've got our level of discipline. We want to use our discipline to make spiritual progress. So I think that's the sort of uh, main principle behind sacrifice. And uh, it's amazing that it's a universal concept, really. Hmm. Wonderful answer there, Sita Ben and uh, Vijay Bhai. Uh, take a next question from Mostar. He's saying, I've experienced something weird multiple times. <laughs> like if something is happening and somehow he knows what is going to happen, the outcome of it. Um, any explanation on that, uh, Sita Ben? Uh, I mean, it's difficult to really answer that. I mean, all I can say is, I mean, this is just uh, my interpretation. I don't know for sure, but um, all of our minds are sort of interconnected. And if you're able to sort of, you know, be very sensitive and you're able to maybe sense things that maybe people around you are thinking or maybe doing, or you may be able to sort of see something happening before it happens kind of thing so this happened to me sometimes just silly little thing like I'm thinking of somebody and then they phone <laughs> so at some level I think we are sort of interconnected at a deeper level at the level of the mind we all share the same mind so perhaps you know we can sort of in a way accidentally bump into other people's thoughts and other people's minds it's it's possible I think um Rude, yeah, I think this is uh, very difficult to understand because ultimately we are all the same, you know, link at the spiritual level, at the Atman level. So I think again, regarding your experiences, most I would say that what's the outcome to you? Has it been positive? Has it made more spiritual? Has it made you link to other people more spiritually, in, uh, spiritual to everybody else? If that happens, then I think you're on the right path. So it depends on how the experience are and what's the outcome. Is it That's the main thing. What's the outcome? I do think you're going to be more connected, more spiritual. I think you have higher things. Then you're on the right path. That's all I would say. Yes. So good for you. Yes. Wonderful answer, Asita Ben Vijay. Why? Um, I've had a bit of that as well. You know, um, mm -hmm. like uh, in one of my SSC, I knew I somehow thought of a number that I would get. <laughs> I had the exact same number. <laughs> so there you go. So yeah, it it does happen sometimes. A premonition and. Uh, it's hard to explain, but it's a universal mind, let's say. Hmm. Uh, move on to next question. Ritu Ayer saying, which book would you recommend to read about uh, Swami Vivekanan Complete Works? Sita Bin? Uh, yeah, the complete works, uh, the life of Swami Vivekanan. Sometimes it's, I think it's maybe better to start with the life story of Vivekanan because if you jump straight into his teachings and his lectures, you may be like, whoa, this is really heavy going. Mm. So if you kind of get a, a feel for what Swami Vivekanan was like as a person, his personality, the things he did, the things he said, it kind of makes you fall in love with that personality. And then you then focus on his teachings and lectures in a way that's more inspiring, I think. So reading about the life of Swami Vivekanand, I think is a good place to start. And then you can then focus on um, his lectures and his teachings, and there's a lot of them. So the complete works are, are there, they're very heavy. Sometimes you can just literally read a paragraph and you can think about it for a week or more. <laughs> they're so deep. Um, so starting off with the life story, I think is a, a nice introduction to uh, the personality. Um, Vijay Bhai? Uh, yeah, I think uh, his life is very inspiring. Uh, if you read it, uh, I read it two, three times, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, it shows kind of, I think the main thing you find in his life is how caring of personality he was. He actually felt people suffering. And that's something, despite being a strong, tough monk, yes, as he was, you see that in his life, life is wherever he's gone, he's always felt that innately felt suffering of people. That's what makes him really special. So I would say that go, go with his uh, kind of life of some American. But regarding his complete works, one thing you can do, you can read the whole nine volumes, which took me many, many years. Or you can just pick the summary they've done, I think a summary of all these important teachings. That's just one. You can pick that up as well. Then you get a summary of all the interesting lectures. So one thing about the complete works of American, which I really like, is that they haven't left anything out. They put everything of his life, all his letters, all his communications, and even sometimes they haven't hidden anything, even more to little aspects of his life where you might think, oh, this is not really how one should live, whatever. But they've left it open to you to decide. And that's the beauty about it. They, the Ramakrishna Math has published everything. 
So you have basically his whole life, you have his whole life to do what you want But start with something small, I guess. Excellent answer there. So yes, focus on life and that will inspire you. And then you can go on to read the Swami Vivekananda's complete works as well. Uh, it is quite heavy. So uh, yes, uh, I think starting with life is a good way to go on that. Uh, next question from Danish Pandit is, can a man in today's scientific era believe in all things mentioned in scriptures, wings of a mountain and things like that? Vijay Bhai? Straight answer is no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the thing is this, look, Hinduism has a vast library of scriptures, not just one. You can fill rooms and rooms. Because in Hinduism, you know, in the ancient times, if you wrote a book, nobody would ask, accuse you of blasphemy and come for your head, right? Which can happen in all the exclusive spaces. Hinduism has no rule like that. People can write what they want. Look, look different things inspire different people. There, but there's so many legendary stories which talk about all kinds of... Um, uh, myths and all kinds of supreme uh, weapons, just like as powerful as thermonuclear bombs, uh, flying planes, whatever. It does not fit. Does not fit well with archaeological evidence we have, or the history of man, or the evidence of DNA that we have on how man evolved. So I would say that get the key message out of it, which is a good mess. The good message, get that out of it. But please don't get stuck into that, because I know there are a lot of people who try really hard to try and find evidence to back that. Don't, don't go down that path. I know I may be, uh, people may have a go at me for saying that, but that's the thing. Keep your rational head <laughs> intact, yes. Please make sure you do that. <laughs> See that. Um, yeah, uh, so I think uh, we have to keep our rational head on for sure. And um, especially in terms of Hinduism, just look at what kind of category that particular scripture fits under. Is it a Shruti scripture or is it a Smriti scripture? Is it a man-made scripture or is it as a result of a spiritual experience? And when you see that it's a man-made story um, with lots of colourful bits and pieces and you're like, oh, that's fun to read we remember that this is not a scripture of authority. It's fun to read. It draws us towards religion and spirituality. But uh, when we sort of grow up a bit, then it's time to focus on the spiritual experiences, the teachings, um, so the scriptures of authority. And that's the philosophical heart of Hinduism. And that's what we should focus on as we progress on our spiritual journey, I think. Fabulous. So we've had almost 30, 35 minutes of uh, scintillating conversation around this topic. And uh, what I just want to say is it's been amazing to see the interaction we've been having on YouTube and Facebook today. Uh, you, the viewers, have been really, really active today. And I want to thank you all for joining us once again. Remember, it's facebook.com forward slash Hindu Academy, or you can go to youtube.com forward slash Hindu Academy. Uh, like we said, today we are focusing on Ramakrishna Paramans and we've got a special playlist dedicated to him or to even Swami Vivekananda and many other playlists that you can view. We have over 3,000 videos that you can view on our channel. So what I'd like to do is uh, just have a quick question that uh, one of um, the viewers on YouTube had asked. This was for Ioni and this is like, you know, one of those googly questions. But the question is this. Will Hinduism survive in this, uh, you know, in the coming future, as Indians seem to be fa facing rampant conversion? <laughs> so over to you guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll have a go. Okay, the thing is that it is true that at the moment the, the conversion is is really happening in India in a massive manner. Uh, I know some people who are actually involved with uh, trying to preserve Indian culture, kind of, and I know some people who work in the travel areas. And I can give an example in Gujarat, there was a huge kind of conversion movement in the Dung area, which is the tribal areas. And when the Hindu groups went down and actually told them, look, there's, there's, you guys are okay as you are. There's nothing wrong with you. Your tribal beliefs are absolutely fine. And they kind of get them more like more, more than anything, financial support, education support. And Imagine said, okay, you know, we're not bothered with this kind of conversion, we won't leave it. The, the reason why conversion works is it plays on people's fears, people's weaknesses, people's financial struggles, all that stuff happens, yes? But you have to be very careful. I think people need to be, India needs to wake up and get people aware. I was talking to one of my friends from the Philippines, you'd be surprised, and um, what he told me was that 100 years ago, when it was an American colony, there was a huge kind of uh, conversion taking place, and a lot of money was poured into the Philippines, yes? They were actually had native beliefs, and guess what? 
Once they became Christian, all the money dried up. They're now very poor. They don't want them anymore. So nothing to do with help, nothing to do with helping people, these new religions, some of them are coming. Not all, I would say that. I know like Christianity is very old in India. The Catholic Church is very old. But some of the new aggressive movements, they're very, very aggressive. The aim is not to help people. I mean, all I would say is that I know some people may get offended, but read the work of Christopher Hitchens on what he wrote about Mother Teresa. It will really quench your heart. It will turn your stomach. And I know when I read that, I just realized that there's something really nasty happening here. But I think Hindus need to wake up. And I know there's a lot of, in, in India, this is a very complex topic, but in India, there's a lot of people are even having go with the current government saying that you're a Hindu government, you're doing nothing about it. But the biggest way to solve this is to get people uh, remove poverty. Remove poverty, and I think half the problem of conversion will go. Because you notice one thing, they never come to cities for conversion. They only go in the poor areas. So if Hindus can do this, what, uh, what um, where you go, so I'm going to start it, the idea of helping the poor to come up, if you can do that, I think it'll fix a lot of problems. And hopefully it'll happen. Regarding some of Hinduism, I think Hinduism is a great future, especially in the, it's going to grow in the West. As a, as a, may not, you know, it may be called Hinduism, but it's the idea is the fundamental idea of Hinduism. The idea is progress spiritually in multiple ways, the idea of Hinduism. Those will certainly flower because in the West, let's face it, in the Czech Republic, I know it's 65% officially atheist. In the UK, it's not officially, but from what I hear from the British Human Society, 50% are atheists already. So as, as, as much as it looks at the winning, all these exclusive faiths, they are struggling too. And I'll give you one secret as well. I talked to one um, imam when I went to interfaith, and he was saying that they have a problem with the third generation Muslims. They are not going to mosque either. They're being forced to. The education is coming. So there are many forces at play. But for India, also the biggest thing to do is to elevate people and give them confidence, give them some help, remove them out of poverty. And I think that that's kind of the best start. And then you just got to show the, the beauty of learning your own faith and become strength in your own beliefs. The part of the problem is you don't even understand your own beliefs. And that's really the sad part. Uh, Sita. Uh, yeah, no, that's an amazing answer. It, it's, it's so true that um, all of these poor communities are the ones that are targeted um, by missionaries and, and things like that. So, yes, like Rijipo was saying, it's so important to empower these people, elevate them, give them the skills to develop and progress in their career and wealth and also then focus on their spiritual um, up inheritance really so yes, expose yes. them to um, the beauty of Hinduism all of the wonderful teachings that we have because if you start preaching to people who are poor and they don't have enough um, food to feed their children it's not going to have any effect so economic um, empowerment is the first thing that must come and then the second thing is then you can focus on their spiritual health and well-being and all of that um, and uh, like Vijay Pai was saying we, it may not be the title of Hinduism which survives or, 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 or not that's not important it's the wonderful teachings the philosophy the philosophical heart of what we have to offer to the rest of the world um, which is hopefully starting to catch fire now and it may have started with um, Swami Vivekananda introducing these wonderful ideas planting the seeds of spirituality in the west and um, i've said this before um india and eastern sort of countries had the luxury of focusing on their sort of inner spiritual journey whereas the western sort of countries had to focus on you know very sort of harsh external environments so you know they're hunter gatherers they're having to fight the cold the wind they have to focus all their energies on the outer world Whereas India had a lovely, pleasant <laughs> weather where we could then have the luxury of saying, what more is there to life and focusing inwards? So we've got a lot to offer to the world. And it may not come under the banner of Hinduism or the title of Hinduism, but that doesn't matter. As long as the seeds of spirituality are sown across the world, then we've achieved our purpose. Amazing. So we have about 15 minutes left to go in today's conversation today. So, folks, remember, if you would like to find out more about Hinduism, there is simply a couple of ways you can do it. You can visit the Hindu Academy website. On there, you will find the basics of Hinduism e-learning course. We have more than 6,000 people who have already signed up for it. I think we can add at least another one or two more zeros at the end of that because there is so much that you can benefit by uh, learning from that simple little e-course. We also have the advanced uh, uh, course for people who are studying for the IGCSE Hinduism exams. And as uh, I may have mentioned last time before, 
the last batch of students who took it all passed with A star, which is the highest grade. In fact, one person passed with 100% marks. So you definitely do well if you're using, um, if you're sitting for that exam to take up the course. You will also find our ebooks, which are available for free for you to download over there. And uh, there are many other resources that you can find as well. So now that the commercial break is over, Manish, bye, back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nisid Bhai. Uh, wonderful question and a wonderful conversation about uh, conversion and what we can do about it. Um, just one more on that, uh, Vijay Bhai. Um, because we have so many temples, mm. our temples be utilized and made uh, as a kind of community center, which is which could become a support center for Hindus and they can be uh, people can be helped from the temple outlet. Uh, financially, uh, uh, you know, provide food and provide education and medical facilities. Would that be a way to go, Vijay Bhai? Oh, that would be a very good. Uh, absolute that would be a way to go. I think that's one thing I've actually even talked to some monks I've met in India, that why can't you use a school in the morning when this morning prayers are finished as a nursery school? So kids don't have to run around in the, in the fields, whatever. It can be done. I mean, there are some who are doing it to be supplied, like, you know, the, the Gorakhpur Mutt, Currently, the chief minister of, of I think Uttar Pradesh, Yogi, his mud is involved in all kinds of activities. So if you go to his mud, they have a feeding center, they have a little school, they have everything running there. So there's some doing it already. But I think this is something that has to be spread wide, far and wide. And that is what is, I think that's the main thing that, look, that's why unique, Swami Vivekananda is unique. Think about it, yes. When he had the money from the West, he didn't say, I'll be a big temple. He goes, no, I want to help the poor people of India. And inside the Ramakrishna mission, right? And you'd be surprised, Ramakrishna today has over 400 schools in India. No discrimination, all poor children come there, whether it's Islamic tradition, doesn't matter, they don't look at how, who you are. The city is going to give them education and whether possible, they give them some food. So they are, they are by far, far, far bigger than the Mother Teresa movement. I think that's bigger. But you see, nobody talks about them for some reason. Yeah, you don't see them past. But Ramakrishna mission is doing fantastic work. But yes, we should use our temples for all these activities. I think in the olden days, it was the case that temples were used as a center for community to get together. And I would, I, I, it's really a pity in a way that it's not the case today. But really, all the free time in the temples should be used up. Why waste all the space? Why build new buildings? Use them for you know, all kinds of activities. So Manisha, I, I'm all with the, you know, the, the person who mentioned, come all for it. And please encourage that as much as you can use the temples for all multiple activities. Yeah. Yeah. Chita Ben. Yeah, I think you've covered it. Um, like we were just saying in, from the previous question, it's really important that the local community has the means to sort of, you know, earn money, support the family, support the community. And there's literally no point talking about spirituality and religion if you haven't got enough food to feed your children. So that's the first step. And if a temple can be used to sort of, economically empower people in whatever way, teaching them skills, giving education, whatever is, is required, then that's definitely the first step to then being able to then focus on your mind on spiritual matters and then come to the temple for spiritual reasons. So mm. it can become a hub for economic power, empowerment as well as spiritual empowerment as mm. well. And um, it's definitely an idea that we need to sort of get out there and hope as many temples as possible adopt these kind of ideas. Hmm. Wonderful. I think Manish Bhai, just to add one thing Sita mentioned, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you something interesting. In my village in India, they've built a, a school, right? A Christian school now recently. And I had a, I luckily had a chance to talk to one of the padres there. I just remembered. And I asked him, why are you so aggressive in India? Why are you working so hard to convert, you know, Hindus? And the answer he gave me was really mind-blowing. It just links to the Sita. He said, the biggest fear we have that India will get rich because before it becomes Christian. So think about what he means there, yeah? So what he's saying is not that uh, he's worried about Hinduism spreading tentacles. Thereby, the India will become much more richer than we won't have all this great people to convert. And as much as we have a go at the current government of India, what this Modi government is doing is trying to end power people economically. It may sound strange, but it's a very big reason. It'll cause it'll save a lot of problems, yeah? That's the main thing, remember. How does India get rich before it comes to this culture, basically? Sorry, go on. <laughs> Thank you, that uh, answer there. Uh, uh, wonderful insight there, uh, Vijay Bhai. Next question from Charmaine, our usual YouTuber. 
she's asking a wonderful question. So she's had a situation at work and uh, see, it meant that just staying silent would have been, you know, supporting a lie. And she decided to stick to principle of uh, Satya and woke up. So could you elaborate on uh, this sort of uh, action being taken, positive action by someone to, you know, support uh, the positive, uh, sticking up for the truth and supporting? Uh, Sita Bin? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a really brave thing to do. Um, sometimes it's much easier to just sit on the sidelines and just sort of pretend it's nothing to do with you and just let it happen. But the law of karma tells us if you see an injustice and you do nothing, you are acquiring bad karma for yourself. So when you see a situation in front of your eyes, it's our duty to do something about it rather than turning our backs. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of um, the Mahaparat story, um, you know, where... Um, yeah, and he, he turned his back and then he had to sort of face the consequences. Um, so, yes, when you see an injustice, you must act on it. And um, in any sort of situation, suppose you go to India and you see a poor community, you see it's your duty to not just turn your back, make sure you do something about it. And the danger of sort of um, be it spending too much time in sort of impoverished communities is sometimes you come become a bit blind to it. You're like, oh, this is just how this is and there's nothing I can do about it. But the important thing is no, make sure you keep your eyes open and do whatever you can to support those around you because that's not only helping those people, it's helping you acquire good karma as well. Um, Vijay Pai? Yeah, I think, I mean, message of the Gita, you know, is in chapter three, reminds me because I'm teaching chapter three at the moment in um, IGCSC. And Krishna by Krishna Bhagavan makes it, makes it very clear that um, doing nothing is not an option. To say, oh, it's nothing to do with me. I just close my eyes. Yes, it's tough. I, I don't you know. I really admire you, Shantanu, uh, because it's a tough thing to do. Yes, to speak out for the truth. But really speaking, uh, not doing is actually incurring negative karma. Don't ever think that it's not my problem, not my business. I should really involve. That's not how it should be. But to be honest, we all do it. I think I may have done it sometimes as well like that because you really don't get involved. But really speaking, sending for just and truth is actually part of incurring good karma. Yeah. Wonderful answer, uh, Sita Ben and Vijay Bhai. So yes, agree. It's, it's very tough actually to follow the discipline of truth. It's so hard. And we do mess up sometimes, but let's continue and try to focus and do the right thing. That is the way to go, I suppose. So um, oh, I heard the mention of Mahabharata there and Bhishma Pitama, who was a lifetime celibate. And we believe he was following the rule of Dharma. But then he was on the bed of arrows. What happened there, Sita Bin? Uh, yeah, so um, he saw the injustice that was happening uh, to the Pandav brothers. And instead of um, doing like what Charmaine did, <laughs> he <laughs> kept quiet and he wouldn't help and support, even though he could see the injustice in front of his eyes. And um, we have to remember that this is just a colorful story, but it does demonstrate a point that he had to then bear the consequence of it. And he had to sort of in the battle, he had to lie on a bed of arrows to sort of in a way pay the price. Um, for his um, standing by rather than taking action uh, when he saw um, the injustice that was happening. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I think, yeah, I mean, it's a very kind of interesting question of Bhishma Pita. One thing to remember in the, in the message of uh, Krishna is very interesting because you see the, the classic case of Draupadi when he saw that, that scene in the Mahabharata of this Romi, and they all said, oh, I'm bound by rules. I'm bound by what rules? I mean, for heaven's sake, yes. And injustice, is, injustice is being done. And you're saying, I'm bound by rules. That doesn't work like that. And that's something, something very interesting of Krishna is that if you look at his whole life story of Krishna, it's very, very so injustice is being done. He didn't think, oh, rules said, we should follow rules. No, no, break the rules. The rules are not right. Don't stick to those rules. I think quite often we have this problem. We stick to tradition. Oh, well, we can't do this. I can't do this because our tradition says we can't do. No, think. Is it right in that particular context? In that context, is it right in the particular in the particular time and age? If not, discard it. And that's very important to remember that. So though I think that's Bhishma Pita, despite being celibate, he, I mean amazing personality, but there are some things he stuck to rules, and that was not the right thing to do. And I think 
Krishna Bhagavan has told us that amply clearly in his message. Yeah? So we have to keep that in mind. Think, don't think, don't think to seek tradition if, if it hurts something. Yeah. Okay. Right. Wonderful answer, Arsita Ben and Vijay Bhai. Um, so uh, we got an interesting question from Bodhi. Says, uh, uh, how important is celibacy in Hinduism for men, especially? Uh, Vijay Bhai? I don't know why I say only men, it's for everybody. Um, the thing is, is, look, ultimately, everything that binds us to the body here yeah, is actually is going to not help us spiritually. The fact still remains that, I mean, for pre procreation, we have the idea of, you know, sex and what is done is, is inbuilt into us. Attraction is inbuilt. So it's not easy to just give it up like that. But as you become, as you progress more and more towards spirituality, you start thinking of higher things. It'll, both will kind of complement each other, right? So the thing is, in that sense, celibacy is important for everybody. It's because that kind of detaches you from the idea of the material and the attract attraction you have to the physical to go to the more kind of spiritual. So it's important for both men and women, not just uh, men. But I think from what I, what my experience is women tend to be more successful than men. But I think it applies to both, yeah? That's, that's my view. I see that bad. Uh, yeah, so um, it's uh, tough to practice a celibate lifestyle, um, but that's why Hinduism is very clever. It sort of offers us a guidance on how we can live our life. So it says, first you become a student and you focus on celibacy, then, you know, you'll get married and that's uh, when you can sort of fulfill any kind of desires that you have. But then after you've kind of had that phase of your life, you can then focus your mind on spirituality, because if you kind of bottle up these desires, you're going to, you know, feel miserable. So that's why Hinduism says, go, go out, get married, do what that, do what you need to do, but then focus your mind on spirituality. Um, because that's really what celibacy is part of is this idea that you are not your body, you're not, you know, a physical being, you are a spiritual being. And that's what celibacy is all about. See everyone around you as being a spiritual being and not a physical body. Um, so that's how you can rise above um, this sort of physical idea um, and make great spiritual progress. It's very difficult to do, but we have to all try our best. Wonderful answer there, uh, Sita Ben and Vijay Bhai. Um... We are coming towards the end of our broadcast. Uh, we'll ask uh, one last question, which uh, let me find one. <laughs> okay, uh, Pramin Kumar is asking a wonderful question. He's saying, "Do you what do you think about Ram Setu being called Adam's Bridge?" Vijay, why? Okay, so first of all, I don't know where the name Adam's Bridge came up. I think it's just some. Don't forget that India has been ruled for, for so many years by, you know, by the, the British and whatever. So I don't think it's, it, they can call it Adam's Bridge, who can, they can call it what they want, but the local people in India, they see it as Ram Setu. But the thing about Ram Setu, one thing to remember is this, that um, a lot of people who actually say that, look, in India, everything is precious. Every mountain is precious. Every tree is precious, very precious and sacred. So Ram Setu being a, a what do you call a, 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 a of a feature, right, of the ocean. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong in India in being as precious and as precious, or at least spiritual. Everything in India is spiritual, right? So in that sense, we cannot doubt that. If people are going to believe it's spiritual, that's absolutely fine. But I think we have to be careful not to go over the top, because I know sometimes there's a big battle in India. The Ram Sethu is cannot be touched, nobody can cross it. Then I think we have to be careful. Don't forget, at one time, in, during the Ice Age, the mini Ice Age, 10,000 years ago, when all the water was locked in the ice in the north, actually India and Sri Lanka were one country. People forget that. Even the whole of Indonesia was one country. Only you just look at geographical history and you see that it's not unusual for these places to be adjoined. So now they're under the sea. So it doesn't mean that actually they are, um, they've been formed by magical power. They're just features and they've been there all the time. Uh, that's all I can say. I don't, think, I don't know why it's going to be, to be honest. It shouldn't be really, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I can't really add anything to that. I think you've answered it amazingly. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. So that brings us to one hour into the conversation today, and we're going to wrap it up for um, today's broadcast. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for joining us. I'm loving the conversation on YouTube. You guys are on fire today, and it's really interesting to see how you're helping each other when it comes to understanding your uh, experiences and helping each other with 
finding out your way with Hinduism in the modern context. So well done on that today. So I'd like to just join my team here at Hindu Academy. We've got the superstars here, Manish Pai, Vijay Bhai and Sita Ben who do all the heavy lifting and answer all your questions. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, you know being here for the rest of the, the viewers who have been tuning in. And with that, I'd like to end with a quote from Swami Vivekananda. And as always, uh, this quote for today is going to be an interesting one. Here goes. The quote is that you cannot believe in God until you believe in yourself. So with that, I'd like to wish you all a great week ahead. And we will see you again next week, Saturday, 2 o'clock UK time, as always. Feel free to like, share uh, this broadcast with your friends and family, because we are still on the hunt to spread the word about this broadcast. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you again next week.